Well, you can turn your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. We are continuing to make our way through this wonderful Gospel, and we're in the chapter of the parables, and today we're going to be looking at the parable of the hidden treasure, along with the parable of the merchant who was in search for fine pearls, and that is found in verses 44 through 46 of Matthew, chapter 13. And I've titled this sermon, The Inestimable Value of the Kingdom. So Matthew chapter 13, and beginning to read in verse 44. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. This is the word of the Lord. The parable of the treasure hidden in the field and the parable of the merchant in search of fine pearls are two parables that teach virtually the same truth. Uh, just as the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven were of uh, a pair of parables that taught virtually the same truth, only with a different emphasis, so it is for this pair of parables. And as we will see, these two parables teach us about the inestimable value of the kingdom of heaven. So let's take a look at them. In the first parable, Jesus describes a situation where a man came across treasure that was hidden in a field. Now, for this to have happened would have been extremely rare because although it was common for people back then to hide valuable possessions and treasures in their field, it wasn't often that someone would randomly come in contact with it because obviously hidden treasure is not supposed to be found. And back then, it was typical for people to hide their treasures and valuable possessions in the ground. Uh, Because remember, they couldn't store it away on a debit card or or in their bank account like we do today. And so what they would do instead is simply hide their most valuable treasured possessions in the dirt. And it's probably not too difficult for us to think of a reason why they might do that. Uh, The reason why they would bury it in the ground was because it would be much safer there than it would be uh, in their own house. If they were to store these treasures within their own house, then it would be much more susceptible to being stolen by a burglar. But here's a guy who unexpectedly came across treasure hidden in a field, and upon seeing that treasure, he covered it up so that it wouldn't be found by anyone else And then he came up with a plan to legally claim ownership over that field. Well, in order for him to do that, he had to sell all that he had so that he could get enough money to purchase that field. And that's exactly what he did. He joyfully sold all that he had to buy the field because he knew it was a field that contained a treasure that was worth gaining no matter the cost. Now, the second parable is very similar to the first. Uh, Jesus depicted depicted the kingdom of heaven in terms of a merchant in search of fine pearls who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had to buy it. Now, in the ancient world, pearls were among the most valuable possessions that someone could own, and only the rich could afford them. Uh, For someone to wear pearls was a sign of great wealth. But pearls were not worn only to display one's wealth, but also to attract attention, to mesmerize, to almost hypnotize others by their captivating beauty. In fact, we know that the wife of the emperor Caligula had pearls just glistening all over her. She would wear pearls on her head, her hair, her ears, neck, and fingers. Pearls 
were highly valued gems that anyone would love to get their hands on, and they were generally obtained in the Persian Gulf or in the Indian Ocean, which didn't make it all that easy for people to get their hands on and, and to find them. But at any rate, Jesus said that there was a merchant, that is, someone whose career is focused on trade, uh, someone whose business is all about increasing their income through buying and selling. Well, this merchant in the parable that Jesus describes, who was eager to find the very best pearl, was obviously dissatisfied with the pearls that he presently owned. But then, the time arrived when he finally found the pearl he was looking for. And it was a pearl that he was willing to give up everything for. It was invaluable to him. You couldn't put a price on it. When he saw it, his mind and his heart immediately exclaimed, This is it. This is the one that I must have. And so he gladly sold all he had to buy that one pearl. Well, what is all of this about? What is Jesus getting at here? Well, remember, parables are earthly stories that have a spiritual meaning. So what then is the spiritual meaning of these parables? What truth was Jesus seeking to communicate? I believe that J.C. Ryle was right when he said, these two parables are meant to teach us that men really convinced of the importance of salvation will give up everything to win Christ and eternal life. The treasure and the pearl both stand for the inestimable value of the kingdom of God as it is offered in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is all of those realities that relate to the kingdom of God, such as having a relationship with God, being able to commune with God, experiencing the salvation of God, receiving the forgiveness of sins, knowing that you are destined for eternal life, and the list goes on and on and on. In effect, it is knowing Christ as your Savior and Lord and being privileged with all the spiritual benefits that that involves. And therefore, Jesus was really describing the kind of people that enter the kingdom of God. The kind of people that enter the kingdom are those who would be willing to give up anything in this life in order to lay hold of the life to come. And you know what that indicates to me? That indicates that no one is going to heaven for the simple reason that they don't want to go to hell. A people are going to heaven because Christ has become so incredibly lovely and glory, glorious in their sight in such a way that they would be willing to give up anything just to get a glimpse of His majesty. Now listen, I also think it's important to point out that the point of these parables are not meant to teach us that we must purchase our way into heaven by doing good works. So we are not to think of the man who bought the field and the merchant who bought the pearl as a spiritual lesson on buying our way into the kingdom. Because the Bible makes it clear that we are saved by grace through faith, and that is not of our own doing, but it is the gift of God. Now, we don't purchase salvation because God has already purchased our salvation for us through the labors of Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He paid the ultimate price so that we would have free access into the kingdom. And so we need to understand that receiving salvation is not dependent upon whether or not we have enough to give. Because the fact of the matter is that none of us have enough silver or gold. In fact, the only thing that we have accumulated in our spiritual bank accounts is an overwhelming amount of debt. So clearly there is nothing that we can do to purchase salvation. We cannot pay our way into heaven. But be that as it may, that does not mean that there is no cost to count in being a disciple of Jesus Christ. 
Because Jesus also makes it clear elsewhere that there is a cost to count. And I want to tell you what that cost is and what it isn't. The cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ is not determined by how much you can give to Christ. It is determined by what you are willing to give up in order that you might receive Christ. I'll repeat that again. The cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ is not determined by how much you can give to Christ. It is determined by what you are willing to give up in order that you might receive Christ. And there is a major difference between the two. You see, when you are unwilling to let go of the things of this world for the sake of gaining Christ, then it means that you value whatever those things are more than you do Christ. A perfect example of this uh, can be found in the story of the rich young ruler. And I want to turn our attention to that story for a moment. So if you have your Bibles, please turn them to Mark chapter 10. And let's just read verses 17 through 22. So Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. It says, And as he was setting out on his journey, a man rose up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. There are three things to note about the rich young ruler. Number one, he was a man who wanted eternal life. He's a guy who wanted to go to heaven. Secondly, he was a man who thought he was good enough to get there. And third, he was a man who loved his stuff. And so what did Jesus do when this rich young ruler approached him and asked him this wonderful question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, I can tell you what he didn't do. He didn't say, pray this prayer. But Jesus made him count the cost. He told him to go sell all his possessions and come and follow me. And Jesus said that specifically to him Because he knew where his heart really was. And he knew full well that he was just looking for a quick ticket to heaven. But at the end of the day, his desire to go to heaven paled in comparison to his desire to hold on to his possessions. Now, make no mistake, the rich young ruler certainly wanted the treasures of heaven. But his big problem other than the fact that he thought he was a good person, was that he wanted his treasures on earth even more. The big problem with the rich young ruler was a treasure problem. He treasured the wrong things, and so his heart was unwilling to let go of those possessions because he loved them so much. Jesus was so right when he said, For where your treasure is, There your heart will be also. The rich young ruler was materially rich, but he was spiritually poor. And so no wonder he left disheartened. He could not see the true treasure. He could not see the pearl of great value, even though it stood right before him. He was too enamored by all the other jewels of this world. And since he was in love 
with this present world. He gave up the true, permanent treasure trove of gold just so that he could store up treasures here on earth where moth and rust destroy. You know, from the perspective of the rich young ruler, for him to give up all his possessions to follow Christ would have meant giving up everything. But from the perspective of the man who found the hidden treasure and the merchant who found that pearl of great value, selling all they had did not mean giving up everything. From their vantage point, they were really giving up nothing to gain everything. My friends, how do you view it? What worth do you ascribe to Christ? How valuable is the saving message of the gospel to you? Can you put a price on it? Well, if it is priceless to us, then it is important that we understand what we will consider everything else to be. You see, when, when Christ and His gospel and His kingdom have become our true treasure and when we have received that pearl of great value, then everything else that would keep us from obtaining that treasure will be viewed in a couple of different ways. And so listen carefully because this is important. When we, by God's grace, have found the hidden treasure, and when the pearl of great value is in the palm of our hands, then everything else by comparison will be considered as either, number one, garbage, or number two, fleeting pleasures. And I want to substantiate that to you. I want to begin by looking at the example of the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3. You don't need to turn there, but I want to remind you of what Paul was speaking to in this chapter. In the context of Philippians chapter 3, Paul was warning the Philippian church to look out for the Judaizers. And the Judaizers were a group of false teachers that were insisting that Gentile Christians needed to follow certain Jewish dietary laws along with being circumcised if they were really going to climb the ladder of spirituality. But by them saying what they were saying, they were becoming a huge stumbling block to the church for the simple reason that they were adding to the gospel. They were saying that salvation is by faith plus works. And when that is the message that is being preached, then you can be sure that the glory of Christ will begin to fade from people's sight. So Paul had to deal with that issue head on, and he confronted the false teaching by using his own testimony. In verses 4 through 6 in Philippians chapter 3, uh, Paul spoke about his own pedigree. He bore witness to the fact that if anyone could have confidence in being saved because of their own strivings in the flesh, then it was him. If anyone could be saved by doing good works and following the Jewish religion, then it was him because he was circumcised on the eighth day. He was of the people of Israel. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, he was a Pharisee. As to zeal, he was a persecutor of the church. And as to righteousness under the law, blameless. You see, before Paul became a Christian, his life was very moral. It was very religious. But his treasure wasn't Christ. But all that changed when he unexpectedly encountered the hidden treasure. And when he did... When Christ appeared to him on the road to Damascus, all those things that he previously found satisfaction in were things that he now considered to be nothing but garbage in comparison to Christ. And he testified to that in verses 7 through 9. Listen to what he said. He said, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss, for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth 
of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Which means that He literally counted them as garbage. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. All those things that Paul used to treasure, everything that he used to find his identity and satisfaction in, such as his power, his position, his prestige, his obedience, all of a sudden it meant nothing to him. Whatever gain he had, he counted it as loss. He counted everything as loss. He considered it to be rubbish, to be garbage. Because the value and the worth of Jesus Christ surpassed it all by a long shot. There was no comparison over where the true treasure was in Paul's mind. The difference between Christ and everything else was the difference between loss and gain. It was the difference between garbage and gold. And so he happily made that exchange. He joyfully sold all that he had to obtain his most treasured possession. Now secondly, when worldly treasures whatever they may be, are placed next to Christ, they can be viewed not only as garbage, but also as fleeting pleasures. Please go with me to Hebrews chapter 11, and let's just look at verses 24 through 26. <clears throat> Hebrews 11 I'm beginning to read in verse 24. It says, By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. What the author of Hebrews gives us here is an incredible, concise, biographical sketch of Israel's deliverer. And what an extraordinary example and model of faith that we have in Moses. Moses grew up in the largest, the strongest, and the most luxurious kingdom on the face of the earth, which was Egypt. And seeing that he was raised as a prince in Pharaoh's court means that he probably had all the toys in the world that a boy could ever want. But at the age of 40, he had a crisis, and he had to decide over whether he would continue to identify as an Egyptian or whether he would identify with his people which were the people of God. Well, as Moses considered the cost, he chose to give up everything that Egypt could offer him. He gave up education, fame, wealth, women, position, and power. He gave up all the treasures of Egypt. He just left it all behind. But why? Why did he give it up? It's because he found a greater treasure, an eternal treasure. His eye wasn't looking to the here and now. He was looking to the reward. He was looking for the city to come. And he was able to see beyond the temporal things because he was trusting in the promises of God. And he knew that indulging himself in all the pleasures of Egypt could not give him the true inward and eternal satisfaction. The sinful pleasures of Egypt were only temporary, and he knew that. 
And by the way, what Egypt offered Moses is the only thing that this fallen world system can offer us. It's called the fleeting pleasures of sin. And you know, there really is a certain amount of enjoyment to be experienced in sin. Because if there isn't, then let's be honest, we would never sin. In fact, in order for us to guard our hearts against sin and to fight sin as we should, I think that it's necessary for us to recognize that Satan is going to present sin as the most pleasurable thing in the world. Anything that promotes the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, you can be sure that Satan is behind it and you can be sure that he is seeking to allure you into his trap. But remember, Satan always presents the bait and he always makes it look so tasty, but he always hides the hook. And when we bite on that forbidden fruit, as it were, it may be pleasurable in the moment, but in the aftermath, it stings like a scorpion. My friends, how did Moses abandon such an overwhelming amount of temptation? How did he leave all those pleasures of Egypt behind? Well, there's only one way that he could if he found a greater treasure, which he did. It was a treasure that was so great to Moses that he even considered the reproach of Christ to be greater wealth than the pleasures of Egypt. And you know what that means? That means that Moses was literally, Moses would rather literally die with the people of God than to live a life just satisfying and gratifying his own sinful nature. When Moses considered the purposes of God and the promises of God for his people, and when he considered the reward to those who trust those promises, he saw how precious that treasure was. It was so precious in his sight that it was worth giving his life up for. When Moses compared the heavenly an eternal treasure with what Egypt could offer him. He considered all the delicacies of Egypt to be nothing than mere fleeting pleasures. And thus he willingly chose to be mistreated with the people of God instead because he was looking to the reward. Guys, how do you consider the treasures of this world? I mean, when you compare the glorious, saving realities of the kingdom of God with what the kingdoms of this world offer you, which treasure is it that has your heart? What about all that stuff that clouds your vision from seeing the glory of Christ? Do you consider it to be nothing but garbage and fleeting pleasures? Look, I know that if your heart is anything like mine, then this is a struggle that we have. This is something that we fight over, and it is a fight worth fighting for. This is what sanctification is all about. This is what growing in the Lord entails. You see, when you first came to Christ, you came because that hidden treasure and that pearl of great price became everything to you. It meant the world to you. And yet we know that we still live in a fallen, sinful world, and that means that Satan and the world and our own sinful nature is working against us. And that means that we're still vulnerable. We can still become dazzled with things that glitter for a moment, but then quickly becomes dust. And that's why we are constantly exhorted in Scripture to set our minds on things that are above rather than things here on earth. And maybe there are some here today whose heart and mind are completely controlled and dominated by earthly treasures. 
Maybe you're just like the rich young ruler who was unwilling to give up his stuff because of an inability to find the pearl of great price. But I want you to know that that pearl, that that hidden treasure is being uncovered before your eyes right now. Christ is offering you forgiveness. Forgiveness for all your sins. He's offering you peace that transcends all understanding. Cleansing, restoration, renewal, abundant life, an eternal inheritance, and you name it. He's offering you that pearl of great value, and I want to tell you that it is altogether precious. You cannot put a price on it. It's priceless, and it's worth everything. And if you understand that, if you have rightly considered the value of this glorious gem, then you will not be coming for it reluctantly or hesitantly. You will gladly forfeit all because you know that in the end you will gain all. Does your heart, does your soul hunger for it? then don't hesitate to come and secure it, to come and claim it as your own because it's secured for all those who look to Christ. So look to Him. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1, it says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Let's just close in prayer. God, we ask that you would forgive us for treasuring the things of this world that are nothing but rot in comparison to all the glorious realities that we have in your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would open up our eyes to see the glory and the infinite worth and value of your Son and all that he's provided, all those saving realities found within the kingdom of heaven. Father, I pray that you would teach us how all the things of this world and all of its pleasures are fleeting and will not last And so may we be on guard to not dig out for ourselves broken cisterns that hold no water when in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Oh Lord, what a tragedy it is to give up our birthright for a bowl of stew. Help us to make the right decision. Help us to see the glory of this treasure and of this pearl, and by your grace, may we pursue it with all of our heart, so mind and strength, for your glory and for our good. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.